good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to our latest LCMB webinar, How to Reduce Workplace Energy Costs and Carbon Emissions. I'm John O'Brien, MD and founder, and it's my great pleasure to be joined by Adam Cook, Property Director at National Express. Good morning, Adam. Hello, John. Great to join you. So National Express are part of the Mobico Group, and they run and operate public transport services in the UK, continental Europe, North Africa, North America, and the Middle East. Um, and today, Adam and I are going to focus on sharing some insights and tips to help you reduce your workplace energy costs and carbon emissions. Next slide, please. So as the uh, video at the beginning showed, LCMB are a consultancy that helps our clients make their workplaces, buildings and estates more efficient, economically, economic and uh, environmentally sustainable. And today uh, we're going to focus on uh, sharing some tips and insights on helping you reduce your energy and carbon emissions. And I'm going to focus um, initially on a short presentation from myself, and then we'll have a conversation with Adam uh, picking up his um, experience and uh, uh, National Express's perspective. So I'm going to cover a four step suggested process, which is starting with um, measuring your energy, uh, then understanding your carbon emissions, identifying the opportunity for savings and then creating invest to save um, projects. So next slide, please. So as the um, four step process suggests, the first step is to measure where energy is used. Uh, within the organization, both in terms of area and uh, and quantum. So typically, the large uses of energy across non-domestic um, sector in the UK will be in heating, lighting, catering, cooling, ICT equipment, fans, pumps, process and transportation. And then when you drill down to a sort of typical office or workplace, it's going to be lighting, heating, cooling, um, ventilation, ICT, information and communication tech, and uh, small power and process. So what, what you need to do is, is gather the data from your organization, which will exist in your BMS metering systems, or individual metering systems, or in your utility portals from your providers. If this data is not available at the right level, these days it's, it's pretty easy to implement a, um, a short or a, a wireless IoT uh, temporary meeting, metering solution, which allow you to capture the info. Next slide, please. So once you've um, captured the energy data, you can then create a baseline carbon footprint for your organization in terms of scope one, two, and three. Scope one being the direct energy that you're using in your organization, oil, gas, LPG, and the direct emissions, such as anesthetic gases or refrigerant and um, and company vehicles. Scope through two is the uh, electricity imported from the grid. Um, and scope three is pretty much everything else in the organization. It's much more complex because you need input from, um, from third parties. So all organizations will benefit from the decarbonization of the grid, which is scope two, as, um, as renewable technologies are added to the grid, reducing its carbon intensity. But to reduce carbon further, you, you need to take a specific direct action. So next slide, please. So once you've identified the energy use and carbon emissions, this will allow you to sort of pinpoint or focus where there's an opportunity to reduce both cost um, and carbon and energy. Um, and this can be done using various techniques, such as heat mapping, as, as the picture on the slide, um, or benchmarking energy and carbon intensity metrics for your organization, et cetera. And this will identify the areas where you're using the most energy and where there's an opportunity to um, reduce that energy, carbon, and cost based on benchmarking to norms with other organizations or other similar um, facilities. So next slide, please. So once you've um, you've identified the opportunity and the area where you want to approach, what I would normally recommend is taking a lean approach to um, to creating investor safe projects. And by this, what I mean is ensuring that equipment or your services are switched off so they're not uh, implemented or paid for when when not required. Ensuring that the equipment and services is at its most efficient when switched on, and then ensuring that the energy source or the mode of delivery of the service is um, the least carbon intensive as possible. 
So that allows you to evaluate the performance, set, set a plan and goals, create a plan, implement it, measure and verify. So next slide, please. So just to give a couple of sort of concrete examples in the sort of scope one, two and three area, applying that sort of approach. Um, the first one is um, is perhaps the one of the biggest areas to, to save energy cost and carbon in organizations, and um, that's lighting. So we can use control, sort of PIR, uh, passive infrared detectors to for presence or daylight dimming to, to ensure that lights are um, switched off when they're not required, ensuring that we're using the most efficient LEDs to replace less efficient technology. And then once we've done that, we're renew using renewable um electricity if possible uh, to drive it. So that reduces the, um, the amount of kilowatt hours and the carbon intensity. Second example is heating, ventilating and air conditioning. So we can use control to optimize um, heating, cooling and air conditioning, ensuring that it's not switched on when not required, that the set points and, and bandwidths are all correct, that the component parts such as fans, pumps, um, filters are all optimized. So, for example, using plug fans rather than centrifugal fans, using modern um, motors um, and using low loss filters and control. And again, renewable technology will 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 make um, the carbon intensity um, uh, reduced. And then two, two examples of scope three um, waste. Most organizations generate waste, but consolidating deliveries, thinking about how um, consumables or uh, equipment is, is packaged and the waste that it re, um, produces allows you to reduce the waste, reduce waste to landfill and reduce carbon and cost. And business travel, another area where most organizations spend significant money thinking about substituting um, online uh, technology for meeting in, in person, much more acceptable these days, thinking about um, doing that to reduce cost. And then if you need to travel, substituting train for plane again will reduce carbon intensity. So next slide, please. So in summary, um, our suggested four stage approach is to measure where energy is used in terms of quantum and uh, location. Uh, cross reference that with the uh, carbon emissions to identify the opportunity for energy, carbon and cost saving, and then create invest to save um, uh, plans using what I've described as a lean approach, ensuring stuff is switched off and not required. When it's switched on, it's at its most efficient. And then when it's up and operating, you're using the most carbon um, light sources of energy. So next slide, please. So Adam, it's great to have you with us here today. Um, National Express have a, an extensive property portfolio and a huge transport fleet. So I guess my first question is how important is energy and carbon reduction for National Express? Thanks, John. Yeah, it's massively important. It's fundamental and it has to be really, it's one of our most important areas of focus outside of course, safety. As an industry, safe, efficient public transport has a massive part to play in the reduction of emissions of, uh, across the globe. Um, for example, every full bus or coach can take the equivalent of up to 50 cars off the road. OK, thank you, Adam. I mean, um, I, I, I guess, you know, thinking about that, that portfolio and thinking about the sort of breadth of what you've got within um, National Express, what are the biggest um, uses of energy in, and the biggest areas of carbon emissions for, for your organisation? Yeah, I mean, obviously the, the, the fleet is the biggest uh, with up to 2000 vehicles on the road every day. Um, so it's critical that you focus on that. But equally, as you say, ensuring our portfolio is efficient and well managed has a huge part to play. Um, ourselves at the moment, we're focusing on some of the you know, the more classic areas really, lighting, HVAC, uh, solar opportunities, um, and looking at what we can do to make our new builds as efficient as possible and to make sure that our current building stock is um, uh, updated wherever, wherever we can. And um, how have you approached reducing energy and carbon emissions, Adam, across um, your extensive state depots and the organisation as a whole? Yeah, we've, we've had a, a really simple, and I think simple works best, it does for me anyway, um, but the simple approach to our kind of whole ESG targets has been a, a three P's approach. It's about our people, it's about our product, and it's about our property and portfolio. 
Um, and from a property aspect, our first step actually was to commission an in-depth review with LCMB to look at all of our major buildings to understand what we actually use them for, how we use them, taking a, an in-use and operation-based approach to the kind of the standard EPC. Uh, and we used that then to pull together uh, a schedule of work across a portfolio that was based on real understanding rather than a kind of formulaic clipboard approach. Okay, that that sounds um, that sounds pre pretty um, comprehensive, I guess. Looking at uh, property, people, and portfolio. So I guess that'll have introduced some challenges for you. And what what have been the biggest challenges you've um, experienced, I guess, in terms of making real and tangible progress? I think actually the biggest challenge, John, has really been around availability of materials and contractors. It's such a busy industry at the moment. So being able to secure good contractors, high quality products, and, and you know, obviously we all have a, a budget to look after uh, and making that affordable. That's been a, that's been a real challenge, uh, making sure that our program is actually deliverable, making sure that our savings are tangible and as I say, not just based on the, the kind of blanket clipboard approach of we can save you 30% here. Um, and, and, and also in some of these areas, obviously making sure that the contracts that we've got in place, so where we're looking at uh, you know, solar PV and we want to put an airspace lease in place, and making sure that the contracts are in place are robust. So actually, uh, although it might be expected that the challenge might be overcoming people's perceptions or creating that change atmosphere in the, in the organisation, actually everything we're doing has been welcomed and the challenge has been more around getting it set up, getting the contractors, getting the, getting the materials and making sure the contracts are robust. And um, with all of that sort of activity, where have you seen the biggest uh, business benefits of return investment from focusing? You know, you're looking at property, you're looking at people, you're looking at the portfolio. So what, what sort of areas have given you the sort of biggest return and the biggest benefit, Adam? Yeah, if we take the vehicles to one side, John, I mean, obviously, yeah, the, the, the zero emission bus fleet is a, is, a, is a massive issue for us. But if we put that to, to one side for the moment, the real low hanging fruit for us in terms of our portfolio has been a wholesale upgrade across the UK to LED lighting, a project that is just about to kick off in earnest. Um, that's a really good quick win and, and, and it's helped in terms of the business case by the changing legislation with regard to you know, standard forms of lighting and flue tubes, etc. Um, so that clearly is a massive benefit. And in some areas, we're seeing uh, a forecast reduction in energy use on site by up to 30 to 40 percent, um, especially on some of the 24 hour sites. Um, longer term, the business benefits, we're focusing on solar PV wherever we can, but also looking at other options such as um, reduction of bulk hot water storage, removal of calorifiers. Uh, introducing point of use water heaters, uh, taking natural gas out of the portfolio and uh, you know, where we can, so using select, selecting um, electric boilers. So the, the biggest, quickest return, of course, I think has to be LED, but then it's also about making it longer term. It's not just, excuse the pun, it's not just flicking a switch, it is a, a, a longer journey. Thank you, Adam. I've got a few more questions for you, but I'm just going to say to our attendees, if they have a question for either Adam or myself, you can drop it into the chat or the question and answer function, and um, we'll get a chance to pick those up um, before the um, before the end of our discussion today. So, Adam, um, what's next for National Express, and have you got any significant projects in the pipeline in this area or any other areas? Yeah, I mean, again, uh, I, I do keep saying about the fleet because that is a, a, a massive project that um, you're actually LC and are supporting us with as well in terms of the infrastructure uh, installation across our depots to support those electric vehicles. But from a property point of view, um, the main goal for us now is really to try and get as close as possible to get our main buildings to the point where the baseload demand is met from sustainable and ideally on-site sources. We're already on kind of a, 
a, a UK-wide green energy tariff, um, which we have been for uh, about three years now, I think. Um, but the real drive now is to make it as close as possible to getting each building base load met through uh, a combination of energy reduction uh, and solar PV. So the, the, the reduction in our demand from the grid is is you know, significant and that, that grid supply really is only used for vehicle charging wherever possible. OK, OK. And, and finally, my, my last question to you, Adam, before we take questions from the floor is you know, and the benefit of hindsight, having looked back at the sort of um, impressive work that you've done at National Express over the last couple of years and your sustainability journey, what tips would you offer to today's attendees or any organisations who are starting on the sort of energy and carbon reduction journey? Uh, yeah, a great question, John. I, you know, from, from our personal experience, you know, say the 3P approach for us has been something that's, that's been, that's resonated really well. So the, the the people, the product and the portfolio. Um, but in real simple terms, I guess for me, it's don't be afraid to start just because you're not necessarily sure where to focus on first, because every journey starts with that first step. And you don't always have to have a, an absolute fixed end goal in order to start the journey. Um, get to really know your portfolio. And, and whilst there's, uh, there's considerable value in you know, the, the standard EPC approach, having a real in-depth understanding of both the operational and in-use demand, that'll help you understand where the real impact can be made. And of course, that means more to the users of the building. If you show that you understand their demand, their operational issues, and you can uh, make these changes without impact to that, then um, yeah, I think that really works. So yeah, Get to know your portfolio and, and as I say, don't be afraid to start even on a smaller project. Um, and dare I say it, don't just rely on the conventional clipboard EPC approach. OK, thank, thank you, Adam. Wise words and um, great advice to, to um, those who've been able to join us today. So I'm going to take questions from the um, from the floor. So if um, if you do have a question for Adam or myself, please feel free to drop them into the chat or the uh, question and um, answer. Um, and Adam, um, so question, um, what, what has worked best for, for National Express in terms of um, reducing your energy and carbon? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go back, John, to the, the that holistic approach that focuses on those three Ps again. You know, um, so looking at how those three areas interact. And so you, you're able to um, introduce your, uh, your project on a, on a real um, interactive way. So you know, understanding for us the, the strategy to move to electric vehicles led us to look at the infrastructure requirements for the building, looked at uh, how we can invest in technology on the new builds and what we need to do to understand the portfolio um in terms of that, that operational demand and that kind of base load um reduction so for us yeah it's taking that real holistic approach don't just think it's uh, the low-hanging fruit i suppose as i say before you know it's not just about leds it's not just about turning your your, your room controller down by a couple of degrees or adjusting your bms it's actually understanding how all of those three things interact your people, your portfolio, and in our case, your, your product, which is our vehicles. OK, thank you, Adam. Um, and another question, um, what are the typical savings that one can expect to see from um, scope one and two projects? And where do the typical uh, our biggest savings tend to come from? Um, so let me give my perspective of uh, perspective on that, Adam, and then perhaps you, you, you can give me yours and National Expresses. So I guess, um, if we go back a couple of years, we would probably expect to see savings of 20 to 30 percent on a um, in terms of energy saving and cost saving on a, a sort of typical invest to save project. Um, these days, a lot of organizations have already sort of captured the sort of low hanging fruit. Um, so it, it gets progressively more difficult once you deal with um, so some, some of the big areas like um, LED lighting, which can um, have a sort of three year payback, maybe a bit longer if you're using um, complex, um, expensive controls, five, five, seven years. 
there's areas like um, uh, insulating um, pipework and flanges in, in, in plant rooms that can potentially have a, a one to two year payback. So massive um, energy savings. As um, Adam mentioned, areas like uh, the use of um, PV, photovoltaics, um, um, solar energy these days, particularly um, with expensive uh, electricity, can have significant paybacks again in the sort of three to five year um, area. Um, and then some, some of the sort of scope three areas that I mentioned earlier are a little bit more complex um, and generally relate to reducing the cost of services that you, that you provide. Um, and again, can have uh, paybacks in the sort of three to five areas, a uh, three to five year area. Uh, but I guess as, as both Adam and I have discussed, the sort of top areas tend to be LED lighting, um, HVAC, where you're using lots of fan and energy uh, control, um, hot water, the use of renewable technologies. And uh, as we say, typically you can get some pretty impressive um, um, payback up to three years or less and, and the three to five years. Uh, does that sort of chime with um, your experience, Adam? Yeah, it really does, John. Um, and in fact, for um, our industrial buildings, where there's, a, there's a, quite a large demand for uh, overnight lighting, um, we're seeing in some cases the any energy reduction from switching to the old from the old kind of uh, sodium lights to modern LEDs. In those industrial areas, we're seeing savings closer to 60 percent uh, in, in some of our buildings. Um, the other things that we're looking at as well, um, for example, one of our, our big office buildings, we're looking at additional filtration to reduce the demand of um, uh, on the um, air handling units. So by filtering the um, internal air environment better, we have obviously got the benefit of better filtration, but we've also got the benefit of a reduced demand of pulling external air in so much. So it, lo it lightens the load on our air handling units. I guess um, just a personal experience. Um, I I converted um, well, our family converted to EVs about sort of a year and a half ago, and we now typically charge the um, the cars at, at night, uh, where we've got an off peak rate between sort of half eleven and half five in the morning at about seven and a half peak kilowatt hour versus twenty eight peak kilowatt hour. So that's a sort of domestic application, but there's a lot more opportunity, I think, for big um, users of energy to think about how they move around their sort of peak load and base load using batteries. And uh, in your instance, you know, your, your buses are essentially um, batteries that you can charge and discharge. So I guess there's there's a lot of opportunity coming through in the way that you configure your, your, your systems. Um, and how you procure your electricity and charge and discharge um, modern systems like EV buses and cars. Yeah, very much. So. And, and something that's really helped us is with the with the vehicle charging. We we've um, worked with a couple of partners, and we have a really complex um, uh, battery management system for our vehicles, which looks not just at individual batteries, but the individual cells of each battery calculates the uh, demand and calculates the optimum charging rate. So it lengthens the life of the battery. And we're seeing in some cases that the uh, vehicle battery life is being extended by a year, two years from expected because of that really complex approach to charging. And of course, that approach to charging means there's less of a surge demand because instead of plugging everything in and having a massive draw on the site, it actually looks at individual cells and balances that out against the time that they're plugged in versus the time they're needed to go out to service in the morning. So it really balances that demand across the fleet rather than uh, the old approach where uh, and TV programs where they used to see a massive spike when everybody turned their kettles on in the adverts. <laughs> so instead of plugging in every single bus at the same time and having that massive draw, it really tailors it per cell. So that that's helped considerably in our, our our spike demand, I guess. So something new for people to think about, perhaps. I'll take one final question before we sort of wrap up. Um, and that's um, if you're unsure where to start, 
what what help is available. So again, I'll I'll, I'll make some suggestions and um, before coming to you, Adam, I guess the sort of classic um, sources of um, free information, such as the Carbon Trust, the Energy Saving Trust, have all got really comprehensive um, guidance and uh, insight and documentation. Uh, locally, in some some areas in the UK, the local enterprise partnerships, the LEPs, who who are now being um, absorbed into local councils, but are still existing for between one and two years, offer support, particularly to SMEs in terms of carbon and energy reduction. And then there's a range of technical organisations such as um, SIBSI, the Chartered Institute of Building Services Engineers, the Energy Institute, um, the or IBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects, who all offer extensive guidance, particularly around the use of energy in buildings and associated infrastructure. Um, and Adam, anything to add to that? Have you found any good sources of help or guidance? Um, yeah, I think rather than looking at uh, other sources, because everything you've listed there is absolutely spot on, of course, John. But the other area that I've found that's been helpful, and, and of course, many of us, most of us now in our building stock rely on leased portfolio. And in many cases, you know, these big commercial landlords and you know, their managing agents, they have their own ESG obligations and, and reporting requirements. So I found taking a partnership approach with either the, the managing agents of buildings or the landlords and investment funds direct, that can be really helpful because sometimes they've got a wider knowledge across their portfolio and they're often prepared to help because everything that you do helps their performance as a, as a landlord as well. So don't be afraid to reach out. I think, thank you, Adam. I think that's that's great advice. So um, thank you again for, for your time, Adam, and, and, and questions. I'm just going to wrap up because uh, we're just coming up to time. So do get in touch if, um, if myself or the LCMB can help you um, with any sort of guidance, advice or support in this area. We're always happy to, to have a coffee and a chat. Uh, you can sign up via our website for our newsletter and there's tips and guides on there to download. And last slide, please. And um, so I'm just going to wrap up by saying a big thank you to Adam. It's been a pleasure to have you join us today. Adam, thank you very much for your time, your insight and your perspective. Thank you, John. It's been a pleasure to be here. And um, I'd like to uh, thank all of our attendees for joining us today. And before we finish a date for your diary, our next webinar will be the 12th of June, uh, where we'll be focusing on how to deliver net zero carbon. Um, the recording from today will be available, so we'll make that available and send out to uh, the attendees who joined us and were unable to join us today. And uh, finally, a big thank you again to Adam and our attendees for joining us today. Thank you and goodbye.